Hello and welcome to 805 Focus, your location for the updates on our nonprofit community. My name is Greg Gorga, Executive Director of Euro Santa Barbara Maritime Museum, filling in for our normal host, Cinder Sinclair. And with me today is Kate Carter from Life Chronicles. You are the founder and CEO of Life Chronicles, so happy to have you here today. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. Can you give us a little history of Life Chronicles? How did it get started? Well, 25 years ago, uh, January 27th actually is the day we started. Uh, I had done a television internship actually through what used to be, uh, I can't remember what it was called, but it was SBTV long ago. And I wanted to do something meaningful with it, didn't know what that was. And then one of my really good friends was diagnosed with lung cancer uh, just six weeks after her husband passed from ALS. Oh my gosh. And their children were 16, 13, and 10. And it wasn't until she took me aside and told me they had told her to get her affairs in order that I walked around for a couple days thinking, what can I do? And I realized, well, I can do video. So I called her and I said, Terry, I want, you to, I want to sit you down in front of a camera and have you tell the kids everything you wanted to know for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And that's really how it started. Oh my gosh, amazing. And so wh where do you find the, the people to do interviews with? They usually come to us. We don't do any outreach or really? advertising or promotion. We have a website, you know, people can find it. But we've worked with, them, with many agencies. We've done over 80 families for the Dana-Farber Cancer Center at Harvard, mm -hmm. Stanford Cancer Sense Patients, uh, Kimmel Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins Sense Patients, and many hospices, including especially the two local hospices here. So do you travel to them when they're out of town? I've been to over 421 cities now and 40 states, 41 states. I, I'm not even sure that's the up-to-date numbers. Uh, yeah, but I travel a lot. Mm -hmm. So so what happens with these videos after you've made them? They're really for the families. Everybody, mm -hmm. up, what are you going to do with these? They're really for the families. So, and we, we film many dying young parents leaving very small children as, long, as young as a year old. And these are absolutely priceless. And we archive everything. And I can't tell you how many times a week we get a call from a now grown child saying, I heard there's this video of my parent. We can't find it. Please tell me that you have it. Oh my and God. we always have it. And I just had a young woman in Canada recently called and said, um, after we sent her the link to her mother's video, and she was 11 when we filmed her mom, she's 25 now, and she said, uh, you have no idea what this means to me. I said, honey, I've been doing this for 25 years, I know exactly what it means to you, and she laughed and says, yeah, you do. Yeah, because I'm sure some people I know with my own parents, I forget what their voice sounded like, right. or even what they looked like to some right. extent, so. Well, it's really important that you bring that up because uh, when we first started, we were given a doctoral dissertation, a separation anxiety study using video with children in the hospital. And the idea was to alleviate their anxiety with this video of their mom mm -hmm. or dad or whoever. Mm -hmm. And it was very successful. And they sent it to us because they felt it would inform what we were doing. And, it, and the most important thing that study showed us, and we did it fr from there on and still do, is by filming people together. So we film families together. We rarely tape someone by themselves, hmm. but when we film them together, the study showed that by seeing themselves together on camera, whoever remains remembers not just the sight and sound of the person who's gone, they remember what it felt like to be with them. And especially for young children with virtually no memories, it just doesn't get any bigger than that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And with the internet now, I'm sure it's so easy for the families to share that with the rest of their family. Right. So, you know, we've, the technology keeps changing and we intend to keep changing with it because we have. Mm -hmm. Started out with VHS tapes and it went to DVDs and now almost nobody wants DVDs anymore. So we have a very large Ven uh, Vimeo account and we create private links for the family which we send to them, so no one can just randomly find this video online, mm -hmm. but they're free to share it with their whole family or whoever they'd like to share it with. Oh my gosh, so there's really no limitations to who you'll, you'll uh, no. talk with. Until. Our focus is seniors and seriously ill, but that's mm -hmm. kind of cool because it covers everybody. So we've filmed one-year-old babies all the way up to 104 years old and everything in between. But you don't have to be dying to have a Life Chronicle. We think that the uh, senior videos are every bit as important and one of the most beautiful things about those senior videos is it gives people at an age when they don't necessarily feel as valued as they used to be or honored as they used to be, mm -hmm. and they feel so validated and so honored uh, by having this video for their family. Oh, wow. And what do you talk about when you video them? So uh, it was just interesting. I had a documentary filmmaker contact me from San Francisco yesterday, and they, always the first question is, well, do you have a list of questions? No. Mm. Uh, even when we train people, even though they desperately want to have a list of questions, we really encourage them to make this a spontaneous conversation because 
we believe in our years of doing this that the most important thing is that whoever watches this in the future will feel like they know that person. The stories are really great. We love all those stories. We have a ton of stories. Mm -hmm. But what we're really going for is for them to show their personality and who they are in that conversation. So having done this for so many years, um, I'm pretty, uh, it's pretty easy for me to walk someone through a conversation about their life, but also about their beliefs or their philosophy of life or the lessons that they've learned or whatever it is they want to pass on. Oh, wow. So, so the first uh, one you did stands out, I'm sure. So what other uh, stories have stood out for you? There's so many, um, but there's, I think there's just this one that I'll, I always remember because it was really uh, pr pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. I was asked to come to Baltimore to film a young woman, 28 years old, with an ALS. She had a two-year-old child and a young husband who was caring for her. And a doctor at Johns Hopkins asked if he could come and observe, so I put him on the second camera, which we don't do second cameras anymore as much as we used to, but he wanted to observe. So he came, and I'm, I'm interviewing her, and at this point, this young woman had a blanket up to here, and she could move her, move her eyes and her lips. That was wow. it. So it was kind of like filming a head in a bed. It was mm -hmm. really pretty stark. And, and that for quite a while, she would cry a lot, and, and she couldn't even, she was on a, I forget what they're called, but it forced air in for her, but she could release air. She couldn't breathe on her own anymore. Mm -hmm. And so the social worker was dabbing her tears for me. You know, I, I was afraid she might start choking on them or something. Oh my gosh, yeah. And I realized in my head, I'm thinking the whole time, I have to help turn this around because she's entitled to speak about whatever she likes, but this is for her two-year-old child, and we need it to not be traumatic for that child. I know that the mother wouldn't want that either. Mm -hmm. But in my head, I'm going, what do I do? What do I do? And out of nowhere, I said, um, you know, her name was uh, Raven, like the Baltimore Ravens. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, Raven, I know that there's nothing good about, you and I both know there's nothing good about ALS, so I wouldn't want you to say that. But at this time in your life, what is it that brings you joy? And she said, my daughter brings me joy. And that was where it went from there. So when we walked out, the doctor from Johns Hopkins turned around and just went, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. what happened? And then a week later, I was still on the East Coast filming, and her young husband called me because he had told, well, it turns out the young woman died the day after I filmed her, which wow. we didn't know was going to happen. But he had just told her mother what we had done, and the mother was just ecstatic because she'd begged her daughter to do something for her little girl. Mm -hmm. Wow. You ever hear from the little girl again? I haven't, but you know, honestly, I think about it a lot, and I might reach out. Yeah. yeah. Because it's been some time, she's probably an adult by now. And I have reached out to a couple young people who are now adults because I had one in, in, even in town where we just never heard back mm -hmm. after the father died, and I just had this sense that there might be an issue. You know, why this woman I hadn't heard from her? And I contacted her, and sure enough, she'd never even been told about it and said mm -hmm. this would have helped me so much in my teen years. I was really struggling after my dad died. So she was just thrilled to have it. Yeah, I was going to say sometimes somebody you might, might not know, a friend or a family, yeah. that, that's right. possible that it they've is. done that. It and uh, I'm sure maybe this happens sometimes when somebody's ill, but they have a turnaround and they still have that on record. I'm glad you said that too, because that's one of the things, you know, Someone calling, if they're the person who has a terminal diagnosis, perhaps, it's very uh, scary for them to even make that call mm -hmm. because in their heads they feel that if they do this, it means they've given up. Mm -hmm. And we learned very early on, we don't ever want to take anyone's hope away. Even if they've been told they have days or whatever, nobody knows for sure. And so one of the things we always tell them is, look, if you live to be 90, you'll still be glad you did this. Mm -hmm. and in fact, I did mine, I don't know, 13, 14 years ago, something, because my Chicago director said, Katie, if you don't do this for your family, and so, when, when something happens, mm -hmm. they're going to be really angry at you that didn't. So I sat down that day, because I was having some anesthesia, general anesthesia the next day, and that's what made her think of it. And when I looked at it years later, I was like, wow, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> and if I live to be 90, I'm going to love it even more, because, you know. Yeah. So how did it feel to be the subject of the interview? Well, you know, it was interesting. Mine was probably one of the shorter ones. Ours averaged about two hours. And mine was only around 40 minutes, but I think part of it was because I'd seen so many people talk about what they wanted to talk about. I pretty much knew what I wanted to talk about. So there was no navigating around stuff. Mm -hmm. I was pretty sure about what I, and then when I watched it again, I've only watched it once, I watched it like 13 years later. I was really surprised um, that I didn't remember the things I talked about. And a lot of yes. times people say, well, do you want to go back and add more? Not really. I always tell people, this is a moment in time. 
that we're capturing mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. And it's not about covering everything in your life or everything that's to come even. It's about capturing this moment. And do you go into the subject, uh, the, the, the folks' homes or, yes. uh, or, or studios too as well? Or? I've, done, um, I've done a lot of hospital ones, mm -hmm. which have been amazingly good. You know, you never know how it's going to go, but we've had some beautiful moments. We had a young mother, uh, about 34 years old, who was dying with two little girls. But her parents and her sister, I had interviewed them the night before because she had gone into a coma but woke up the next day so we could film her in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But her parents showed up with her sister and we pulled her bed away from the hospital wall and they got behind her so they could all be seen on camera and they sang beautiful songs together. It was incredibly moving. You must have had a lot of moving moments. Many. And it must be a little bit difficult to, to, talk, to meet with people who you know are, are terminally ill, but to provide them with this gift has to be fulfilling. Well, I was having that conversation yesterday with that documentary filmmaker. You know, it's about compassion, really, when you get right down to it. And you have to be willing to be present with someone's pain and suffering and whatever they're going through mm -hmm. and, and just let yourself fall away when you walk in the door. It's not about you. Mm -hmm. And be present with them. And I have to say, though, you'd be surprised how many very humorous moments happen. Mm -hmm. Really, really funny. I did a man with his family in Carpinteria, and we just laughed the whole time, and we couldn't even believe it. But that was who he was, you mm -hmm. know? So it was great. Yeah, that has to be wonderful. So you did some film training originally, and then you had this idea. Any other training throughout? Well, you know, before that, I was an executive assistant to a president of a company for five and a half years, which gave me all the skills for administration to, because I started a nonprofit from scratch. I didn't know anything about the nonprofit world. So the nonprofit support center at the time, I was a regular there to anything that I, they offered as a course, I took it. And even to this day, I don't, I'm not the best at the, the whole thing, especially fundraising. I'm, I'm not good, and especially grant writing, it's not my thing. But um, I had those administrative skills, so I wasn't afraid to do a lot of the organizing. Super important for us to be organized with 1,900 videos. We have hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of tapes. Until 2013, we were still doing tape. Now it's all, you know, on hard drives. Mm -hmm. But um, keeping everything organized so that any time that person calls, no matter how long ago it was we filmed for them, we can say, yes, we, we have it right here, and here you go. Yeah, because you'll never know when somebody wants to yeah. ask us that. Yeah. And do you have other staff? We had, we had a full staff until COVID. Mm -hmm. And then we were just doing a, a whole staff, uh, new, bringing in new staff, because other staff had gotten other jobs, or one was elected to city council and other things like that. So we um, literally a couple of weeks before the shutdown, we had a board meeting about, okay, it's time to restaff. And COVID hit, and I'm really grateful we hadn't restaffed because we had to close our office because we couldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And now we've been working remotely with no problem. Oh, wow. But I do think we're still going to restaff up mm -hmm. even if we continue to work remotely because we're just too busy. I mean, I just did six in 10 days, three here, and one in Boston, one in Brooklyn, and one in Salt Lake. And it's just pretty slammed right now. Uh, that is a lot. And do you utilize volunteers at all? Yes, we do. So how do you? How can somebody volunteer with you? Well, anyone can volunteer with. I recently had a really amazing retired man, 82 years old, but a retired a, a, a psychologist who mm -hmm. was actually um, at, taught at UCLA for years and got his PhD at USC. But heard about us, loved what we were doing, so he's been volunteering, and he's a wonderful guy. But we really love working with young people, and we always have because it changes their lives to have these experiences. Mm -hmm. And if you go on our website on the testimonial page, you can read some college essays that some of the kids wrote. It's really, really gratifying for me to see that we had that impact that we hoped it would have. So they worked with you to do the recordings? Yes, so we, we never trained them to do the what we call facilitating, because it mm -hmm. requires a pretty high level of maturity and they just mm -hmm. don't have that yet. Sure. Life experience that they don't have yet. So when I interview World War II store vets, which I've done over 50, I have a lot of knowledge about that, but they don't really have much knowledge, so you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. But we like to have them do camera. You know, mm -hmm. they, they love to edit. We have them, let, help them help us with editing, so we love working with them. And how many facilitators do you have that are helping you with the interviews? I'm the only one on staff, certainly, at the time, but we tra did train both hospices here, mm -hmm. a, a number of, I think, six in each agency, something like that, who are available to do that. And then I have volunteers in other part of the country who've worked with us for many years that help with that too. So you're flying around all over, yeah. uh, so that's got to be very expensive. So how can the community help support this wonderful work that you're doing? Well, fortunately, 
we never travel without someone paying for the travel because we're too small and it's too much for mm -hmm. us. And like the last trip I did back east, the people joined together to donate toward that. But often they can't donate anything else. And a lot of people are donating miles to us, you know, and mm. that's how they're able to take care of that. But certainly we have lots of other uh, support that we need all the time. So people can go to our website on lifechronicles.org and we have a donate page, which we're really grateful for. But we also have a big event coming up on June 4th called Fun in the Sun and we're honoring, um, for our Remarkable Life Award, we're honoring Nancy Copeland, who was a really major life force in this town and we filmed her just a couple months before she passed and she very much supported our work. Oh, wonderful. We and filmed Michael Tobes the same day. It was a big day. Oh, wow. Right, oh, oh, just wow. 17 days before he passed. Oh my God, I remember he Great Partnership man. for Excellence, so they announced his passing. Right. Yeah, so you do that event annually. Well, we do the Remarkable Life Award. This yeah. year we're calling it Sun and the Fun because Nancy, in her, when we filmed her twice, was all about fun. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, that's, and all we, also we felt after COVID, we all needed to have some fun. It's been a long time. Sure, so it's interesting. Financial support, certainly you need, but people can also help with air mileage to help you fly to these yes. different locations yes. as well. I had a young man whose wife I filmed at ALS of Florida, a young man, and he donated 40,000 miles to us so that we could yeah. cover a lot of bases. And so people who are know somebody that th th they want to have a recorder, if they do, they just go to your website and can contact you that way. Right, or they can call the number that I think is, or email that's gonna be shown on the screen. Mm -hmm. Wow, nice. Any other, uh, that's just, um, um, just such a wonderful idea that you came up with. It I know, is. it's kind of hard to believe, but I have to say though too, when, it, when we started, it's become so much more than we thought in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Little did we know that USC, Keck Medical School, doctors would have publish a white paper on the therapeutic value of what we do. We thought it was all about memories when we started, which is true, it's great, but it has an incredible therapeutic value for people, especially people who are grieving, you know, mm -hmm. it's really important. So it's therapeutically valuable for the person you interview yes. and their family. Absolutely, families. it's a win-win for everybody. And, and I'd like to say too, um, something we said about people calling. Um, I, I hope people don't hesitate to call because we've literally filmed a person the day be they died and the day before they died. It, they rise to the occasion and they fully are aware that they get to do this and it empowers and invigorates them. So it's never too late to do it oh. until they're gone. And then until they're gone, yeah. And how, out, how far out do you uh, book your interviews? Whatever people want to, but we really encourage people not to wait, especially mm -hmm. if it's older people, because things can change in a blink. Absolutely. And they might not be able to talk anymore, they might not have any memories anymore, although we do a lot of Alzheimer's work and it's been really beautiful. Really, tell yes. me about that a little bit more. So, uh, and lots of Lewy body as of late, we see more and more Lewy body dementia, but I'll, t I'll tell you one of my favorite stories. We were asked to film a woman over in Alamar. Uh, there's an Al Alzheimer's facility there, it's, the name's escaping me, but we, the nurse called and said, could you do my mom? She said, she's not early stage, she's fairly late, could you do her anyway? Do I need to go quick? No, you can. Okay, and so we get there, and I had a young intern with me, a high school student, and great guy, still to this day, 18 years later, still lives in Texas, but still does work for us, you know, helping us design new logos or whatever. Anyway, we walk in and here's this adorable little lady, but it was very clear immediately that we would barely get a yes or no from her because she just didn't have that capacity anymore for mm -hmm. us to ask her questions. But her daughter put a Red Sox baseball hat, thank God we had the camera running. She put a Red Sox baseball hat on her head and that woman proceeded to sing two verses of Take Me Back to the Ball Game. Oh her my daughter's gosh. tears streaming oh. down her face because this was for her sister in Florida who didn't get to see her mom, wasn't gonna be able to see her. Mm -hmm. And this was more than we ever thought we'd get. We've had some amazing Alzheimer's experiences. Oh, I bet. Well, thank you, Kate. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and thank you for the wonderful work, work you do with Life thank Chronicles. You. And thank you everybody for listening to 805 Focus. We'll see you next time.